Two years from now, all Mac computers will have the new silicon architecture. It will allow faster computation, use less energy, and allow flawless compatibility with the whole Apple ecosystem. The technology that allows this innovation comes from the ARM architecture. This is a set of instructions for computer processors developed by ARM Holdings. ARM Holdings does not manufacture chips, but it licenses the architecture or the intellectual property to other companies, which in turn use the set of instructions to create their own chips. Apple Silicon is designed by Apple and it includes many innovations introduced by Apple engineers, but the chip is still based on a set of instructions developed by ARM. And every company using these instructions pay an FT fee to ARM Holdings. The link above will take you to a video about ARM technology with some interesting comments about the relationship with Apple. But what if two years from now any computer company can develop a chip like the Apple Silicon or the Apple M1 using an architecture similar to ARM but completely free? This is a possible scenario with the increasing popularity of RISC-V, the Linux of hardware. RISC-V it is growing rapidly and it is often labeled as the alternative to ARM. And because it is available for free, it is considered a game changer that could open a new era of chip design and eventually a new era in hardware manufacturing. RISC-V started in the academia, developed by professors and students at Berkeley, that needed a set instructions architecture but could not afford ARM licensing fees. As it often happens in these situations, from academic toolkit, the product became a worldwide phenomenon. Along the way in fact, it enlisted supporters like NVIDIA, DARPA, Western Digital. Most of the credit for the development of RISC-V goes to David Patterson. Patterson's current role is VP of RISC-V International the body that promotes the development of RISC-V architecture. Patterson is also one of the luminaries of the semiconductor industry. He is also behind the development of RISC and RAID chip architecture, basically the design of the chips that are present in all computers in circulation today. Since the 90s, all students in computer science have most likely studied on computer architecture, a quantitative approach, which Patterson authored with John L. Hennessy, and it is considered the bible of computer architecture. David Patterson was at the RISC-V Global Forum 2020, he talked about the pillars of RISC-V and his vision for the future. Here are the highlights. At Berkeley, we were trying to develop an instruction set for use by other academics, so naturally we kept it free and open under the Berkeley Software Distribution License so that anyone could use it. Now, what that means now that it's being used commercially, it allows more competition, which I think is more innovation. And it also had this big impact for startup companies is they could pick the instruction set first and figure out the vendor later, or for proprietary instruction sets, the first thing you have to do is negotiate a contract with the company, which can take months as well as a lot of money. The second feature is keeping it simple. Well, since it was being developed for use, not only in research, but education, you almost always will subset a complicated architecture to explain it to the students. So that just became that core became the actual core. And what the innovative idea was that all software ran on it. So this makes it dramatically simpler. You can have a RISC five that you can port software to that's dramatically simpler than any other commercial instruction set. And there's many examples where that's made attractive to people. Given that you're gonna run the whole software on that core, what that meant was another important feature is that it's modular, that the extensions were optional versus required. So this is a giant change in instruction set philosophy. In the past, because of concerns about binary compatibility, things had to be upwards compatible. That is if one generation added instruction, all feature, all feature generations also had to have that instruction, whether that was useful or not. That's not true for RISC-V because of its academic roots uh, that every, all software would run on that core instruction set. There were instruction set options that were optionally available. So something that gets added isn't gonna be part of every computer going forward. It'll be there or not. Another thing, it was making it easy to enhance, basically to make it easy to evolve to let it uh, add its special purpose instructions. That was clear from the roots at Berkeley in the PAR lab. We knew that Moore's law was ending, Denard scaling was ending, 
that the future was going to be accelerators and we needed to have opcode space to do our research. So that was built in from the very beginning. For the cloud and the edge, computers of that era already had 32 and 64 bit addresses. The novel idea was 128 bit addresses. Uh, and that was the argument then was because we were thinking about warehouse scale computing. There were already uh, enough storage in the warehouse of two to the 50th bits. So eventually it would get up to 128 or get above 64 and the next power of two was 128. And then that's gonna you know, last uh, forever. But the only flaw that you can't recover from in computer architecture is the address size. And the easiest way to handle that is just double the size of the registers. So that was natural. And then community involving it at those first workshops, companies were interested, but said, if you're just going to keep it as an academic, we, we can't trust our company's future in that. Because typically what happens in academic research is after the graduate students graduate, you know, the faculty move on to something else. So inspired by Linux, the, and the Linux Foundation, we created the RISC V Foundation, and eventually it becomes RISC V International, and it owns the instruction set. And then another uh, issue that came up was security and trustworthiness. Just what happened in the world in the last 10 years, nation states wanted to be able to make sure that they had processor designs, that they knew everything that was inside. So by having open architecture, that I mean, anybody could build it themselves, and also because of open cores, you could see what was in it so there wouldn't be any secrets or trap doors. There's more than 600 members in almost 50 countries all over the world. We have nearly 2,000 people participating in the various efforts to extend RISC V. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. Speaking of a worldwide phenomenon, and let's talk about RIPS 5 International Open Source or RIOS Laboratory. Its five year mission is to make the RIS 5 ecosystem world class. Uh, its nonprofit will judge success by technology transfer. He uses our ideas. Everything's going to be done in the open. We're going to try and build industrial strength IP and we're going to consciously try to avoid patent lawsuits by uh, being careful what we build. The funding, as I said, comes from the city of Shenzhen. There's also going to be matching funds from companies, and they're also going to loan engineers to work on our open source projects. It'll be distributed around the world, but the majority of the engineers are going to be at TBSI. TBSI stands for the Tsinghua University and UC Berkeley. It's a joint venture in Shenzhen, and it's been around for several years. We're going to be one of the labs there. We're members of the Chips Alliance and the FOSSE and we're a premier member of the RISC-V International. I'm going to be the director here in the United States, but uh, Zhang Zhi Tan, one of my former students, is an adjunct professor, will be a co-director, and another Berkeley alumni, Professor Lin Zhang, will be a co-director there in Shenzhen. So I, and like a lot of people, think in the next five to 10 years, we'll see RISC-V everywhere. Probably start with Internet of Things, Maybe the next thing will be going into the cloud, into server room, and then eventually for phones and, and, and notebooks. But I think it'll be everywhere. But that's one vision. The other vision is around the open source, is that right now we're having these tensions in the world. The information technology is thoroughly globalized. Pieces are built all over the world, and this, these tensions are going to cause problems in our industry. I'm hoping that with uh, open source software projects and open source hardware projects where people are genuinely collaborating with people in other countries all over the world, that that'll help reduce these tensions and, and make our industry more effective. How are we going to decide which IP to build? So we, we first we want to have a project to drive it, and we also need to build hardware to make sure that the IP that we're going to put out there really works. So we decided that the Pico Rio project will do that. Pico Rio, and here's the logo for it, is a small board computer, but it's based on the open RISC V and open cores. So it's like Raspberry Pi, but open using RISC V instead of ARM. Our plan is every year to bring out a better version of increasing sophistication, and each iteration will use more open source IP and whatever low level software we have to bring. 
And eventually, either all of the IP or as much as we possibly can will be open source. We'll be the gatekeeper of both the hardware and software and license it to make it low cost. So we're killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. Figuring out a vehicle to make sure our IP really works and then providing a platform that's inexpensive for software developers who don't want to spend $500 to build it or to do that. There are still substantial gaps in certain application areas, but community enthusiasm, corporate investors and government-funded development are driving rapid progress. And if there is a gap in the ecosystem, someone is working on it.